The Hidden Heirloom A Bomkesh Bokshi Story by Sharodin Lubandupadhyay Bomkesh was out of work for some time now. The people of this country have a bad habit of not even informing the police about small crimes like theft. Better to have peace than prosperity. That is their philosophy. If something serious happens, the police get to know but no one spends hard-earned money on a private detective. For some days they moan and groan and complain, even abuse the police, then they forget about the whole thing. Murders are also committed in our country, but most of the time they are acts of anger, unplanned and unintelligent, so that the murderers are caught at once, put in the jail and later hanged. So. It's not surprising that the truth-seeker Bomkesh Bakshi had hardly any truth to seek. Bomkesh was not at all bothered by about this. He continued reading the newspaper from its northwest corner to the southeast corner in detail, and the rest of the time he spent in his library behind closed doors. But I was getting impatient with so much of free time. Though my job was not to catch criminals, but to entertain readers with my stories free of cost. In fact, that was the motto of my life. I was addicted to the catching of the criminals. As a result, life was getting as boring as a saltless diet. So that morning, while drinking tea, I asked Bomkish, What has happened, brother? Have the thieves and criminals of Bengal become saints and sages? Bomkish smiled and said, no, you are getting proof of that in the newspaper every day. True, but why are we not getting a chance to catch them? Patience, we will get a chance. The fish will take the bait at its own time. We can't force it. An intelligent criminal is becoming a paradox in our country. It's not my fault. Most of the names in the police diaries are of small fries. Those big fish hardly swim up to get caught in the net. I am interested in these. You must be knowing that those ponds or rivers which have large fish are a temptation to people like me. I said, your similes have a fishy stink in them. If there was a psychiatrist here, he would have certainly concluded that you would leave your job of truth-seeking and start selling fish. Bomkish said, in that case, the psychiatrist would have made a terrible mistake. Just then, there was a knock on the door. The postman delivered a letter. Letters were a rare commodity in our lives. So its arrival instantly aroused our interest. It was an insured letter in Bomkish's name. When he pulled out the letter from the envelope, we were more impressed. There was a bronze and blue monogram on top of it. The paper was thick, smooth and expensive. Attached to the letter was a cheque of 5,000 rupees. Bonkish read the short letter and passed it to me smilingly. Take it. A very serious matter. A mystery in the home of a rich elite in North Bengal. I have been asked to go there post haste. Even the travelling expense has been advanced. The secretary of the gentleman has written, Kumar Tridib Narayan Roy has asked me to write this letter to you. He has heard about you and wants your help in advising in advice regarding a very serious matter. So we will be grateful if you can come here as soon as possible. Let us know which train you are boarding and we will send our car to the station. Yours, etc. No fact could be gathered from the letter. I said, it seems very serious. Could you make out anything from the writing or the paper? You are knowledgeable about these things. No, but from what I know about the rich in our country, I wouldn't be surprised if Kumar Tridib had a nightmare that his pet elephant had been stolen by his rival. Frightened, he has called for a detective. No, no. I think you are exaggerating. Can't you see that he has already sent so much of money? 
something serious must have happened. That is your mistake. If the patient is wealthy, you think that his illness is also serious. It is usually the opposite. A doctor is called for in case of the rich even to treat a small pimple, but a poor dies unattended, even he, if he is seriously ill. Anyway, are you going? Monkish thought for a moment. Since I have nothing else to do, let us go for two days. At least we will see some new places. I don't think that you have been to those parts. I was very eager to go, but I hesitated. Should I go? They have called you only. Bumkish smiled. Nothing is wrong in your going. In fact, Kumar Bahadur will be happy to see two of us instead of one. Besides, since someone else is spending the money, it is our moral duty to go. According to the scriptures, we should always go on a pilgrimage at other people's expense. I could not remember which scripture had given such wise advice. Anyway, I did not need, need much persuasion to accompany Bomkesh. We left that evening by train. Nothing much happened in the journey except that we met a very friendly man. There were only three of us in the compartment. After chatting with us for some time, the gentleman asked, Where are you going? In reply, Bonkish smiled pleasantly and asked, Where are you going? The gentleman was a bit bewildered by the question. I will get down at the next station. Bonkish again smiled and said, We will get down at the station after the next. There was no need to tell such a lie, but I realized that Bromkish must be having some reason for doing so. As soon as the train stopped, the gentleman got down. It was dark outside, and he soon vanished in the crowd. After a few stations, I got down at the platform to stretch my legs, when I spotted the gentleman in the compartment next to ours. He was staring at me, but as soon as our eyes met, he ducked. Excitedly, I told Bomkish, Listen! He said, I know, the gentleman is in the next compartment. Things are not so simple as they seem. That's good. After this incident, I tried to trace the gentleman at each station, but failed. Early morning, we reached our destination. We would have to travel for about six or seven miles by car to reach the house. The station was small. An employee of Mr. Roy was waiting for us with an expensive car. He welcomed us warmly, and soon we were on our way, moving fast through the lonely roads. The employee was elderly and very discreet, because when Bonkish tried to probe, he said that he knew nothing. He was only obeying orders by receiving and taking us to his employer. We looked at each other and remained quiet for the rest of the journey. When we reached there, we found that we were entering a huge ancient mansion. It consisted of five wings. There was a beautiful garden, hothouse, swimming pool, tennis court, guest house, etc. There were a lot of workers, servants and employees around. We were taken in by Mr. Roy's private secretary. We were given a whole suit to ourselves. The secretary told us, Please freshen up and have some refreshments. Kumar Bahadur will also be ready by then to meet you. After a good breakfast, we were relaxing while smoking, when the secretary came and told us to follow him. Kumar Bahadur was waiting for us in the library. We felt as if we were going to have an audience with the king. The grand welcome, the very name Kumar Tridib Narayan Roy, inspired some kind of awe. But when we met him, we found that he was a simply clad, pleasant, fair and good-looking young man. There was no pomposity in his behavior. He stood up when he saw us, folded his hands in greeting, looked hesitatingly at Bomkish and said, are you Bomkish Babu? Bomkish introduced me and said, He is my friend, assistant and future biographer. That's why I always take him along with me 
wherever I go. Tridip Narayan smiled and said, I hope your biography won't be written in a long time. I'm glad that Ajit Babu has accompanied you. It is through his writings that I got to know about you. I was filled with joy, the kind that every writer feels when his writing is mentioned. We realized that although he was wealthy, he was educated and intelligent. The library was packed with different kinds of books. On the table too some books were scattered, proving the fact that the library was not only a showpiece, but also that the books were regularly used. After some small talk, Kumar Bahadur asked his secretary to leave us alone and also to shut the door behind him. Then he started speaking. The job for which I have given you all the trouble and brought you here is very serious and very confidential. So before I tell you anything, you have to promise me that no other person will know about this matter because it concerns the prestige of our family. Bromkish said, I don't think it's necessary for us to promise anything because we consider all the affairs of our clients as highly confidential. That is our professional etiquette. Anyway, how do you want us to take our vow of secrecy? Kumar smiled and said, There is no need for a vow. Your word is equally valuable. I was a bit hesitant. Can I not even mention the affair in the form of a story? A determined Tridib said, No, I don't want any discussion about this. I sighed with disappointment at missing a chance of writing a good story. Bomkish said, Don't worry, we will not reveal anything. Kumar was quiet for some time and then said, We have very old and expensive jewels, stones and diamonds in our family. I don't think you know about it. Bomkish said, I do know a little about those, especially a particular diamond which is rare and exquisite. You know about it? Then you must also be knowing that last month there was an exhibition of precious stones in Calcutta. That diamond was shown there. Bomkish nodded his head. Yes, I heard about it, but I was not fortunate enough to see the diamond. Kumar was silent for some time. You may never get a chance to see it. It has been stolen. Bomkish echoed. Stolen? Tridib said, That is why I brought you here. Let me start at the very beginning. Our family dates back to the times of the Mughals. It was during this time that my ancestors were given this land as a gift. My ancestor was a bold and courageous person who persuaded the emperor to give a deed of grant for the land. We still have that deed with us in the family. The diamond has been handed down from those early days till now. There is a saying that no harm will come to our family if the diamond remains with us. But if it goes to any other branch of the family, our family will be destroyed. The heir to the property is the eldest son. That is the rule of our family. The younger sons will get an allowance. So, after my father's death two years ago, I inherited the property. I am an only child. At present, I have an uncle who gets a few thousands a month as an allowance for, from the family coffer. This is just an introduction. Now let me tell you how the diamond disappeared. When I got the invitation to exhibit my diamond in the exhibition, I took it in a special train to Calcutta. I only heaved a sigh of relief when I handed it over to the organizers. You must be knowing that in this exhibition exquisite jewels and diamonds from the royal families of Baroda, Hyderabad, Patiala, etc. were displayed. It was a prestigious affair, and the government itself was responsible. So it seemed impossible for the diamond to get stolen. It was kept in a glass case, and only I had the keys to it. The exhibition went on for seven days. On the eighth day, I came back home with the diamond. 
It was then that it was discovered that it had been stolen, and what I had brought home was only an inexpensive imitation worth about two hundred rupees. Kumar was silent. Bonkish asked, Didn't you let the police or the organizers know about the theft? Kumar said, That would have been useless, because as soon as the theft was discovered, I knew who had stolen the diamond. Oh, said Bonkish, and looked searchingly at Kumar. Please continue. Kumar said, It is not a matter to be discussed. I did not even let my close family know about it, in case there was a scandal and people got to know about it, or if it went to the press. The only other person who knows about it is our old Divan, who looks after the finances of our family. I will tell you everything in detail. I have already told you that I have an uncle. He stays in Calcutta and gets few thousands as an allowance from the estate. You must have heard about him. He is a famous artist and a scientist, Sir Digendra Narayan Roy. He is a strange man. If he was born abroad, he would have been recognized as a genius. His knowledge is vast and he is extremely intelligent. In his young days, he had discovered some unknown facts about the plaster of Paris. He was knighted by the British government. Even in the world of arts, his talents are well known. You must have heard about him. Everyone knows about the accolades he won in an art exhibition in Paris, where he exhibited a stone statue of Lord Shiva, sculpted by him. A multifaceted person like him is a rare phenomenon. Kumar smiled. My uncle has a great deal of affection for me, but we don't agree about one thing. He asked me for that diamond. He had an unnecessary desire for it. It was not for its monetary value that he wanted it. He just wished desperately to possess it. I asked, how expensive is the diamond? Probably three crores or more. No one can buy it with money in our country. Besides, we never evaluated it. It was regarded as an auspicious charm in our family. It was priceless. Anyway, my uncle even asked my father for the diamond, but my father refused. After my father passed away, he asked me for it. He said that he did not want any allowance. Instead, he requested me to give the diamond. My father warned me about it before he died. So I told him that he could ask me for anything else but the diamond, as it would go against my dead father's wish. He said nothing, but I realized that he was very displeased with me. After that I did not meet my uncle. But I got a letter from him on the day I returned from Calcutta with the diamond after the exhibition. It was a short letter, but enough to make me nearly faint with anxiety. Read this letter. He opened the drawer of the secretariat table with his keys and took out a letter. It was written in a beautiful hand. Dear Trivib, don't be sad. You did not want to give it, so I took it myself. Don't believe in the superstitious story of your family being destroyed if you lose the diamond. It was just a ploy of our ancestors to ensure that it remained with only one branch of the family. God bless you. Your uncle, Digendra Narayan Roy. Bomkish returned the letter silently. Kumar continued. As soon as I read the letter, I ran to the locker room, opened the vault, took out the box with the diamond, and found that it was there. I called the divan. He got it checked by an expert, an experienced fellow. He said that it was a mere imitation, but it looked exactly like the original. Kumar opened an almira and took out a velvet box. The rounded stone reflected the light and sparkled as soon as the lid was opened. Kumar lifted it with two fingers and passed it to Bonkish. No one except a jeweller will know the difference. This one costs only about two hundred rupees. For some time the two of us looked at the stone. 
Then Gomkish gave it back to Sridhi Narayan and said with a sigh, So, my job is to get back the diamond. Kumar looked keenly at Bomkish and said, Yes, I don't want to know how it was stolen, but I want my diamond back at any cost. I am ready to pay any amount for it. Don't worry about expenses. But please see that this affair is not leaked to the press. Bomkish said casually, How soon do you want the diamond back? Kumar's face shone with happy expectation. How soon? That means you're sure to get it back for me? Bomkish smiled. It's a very simple matter. I expected a much more complicated mystery. Anyhow, today is a Sunday. You will get back the diamond by next Saturday. Saying this, he got up. After returning to Calcutta, we could do nothing on the first day. We spoke in the evening. Have you chalked out any plan of campaign? I asked. Bomkesh said, No. Firstly, I will have to see the house and get some information. Only then I will chalk out a plan. Is the diamond in the house? Of course. The greed of the diamond made an uncle steal it from his nephew. Is it possible for him to part with it even for a moment? I will only have to find out where he has kept it. I think... What do you think? No, it's only my guess. I will have to meet old Digendra Narayan before I arrive at any conclusion. I was quiet for some time, then said, Bomkish, have you considered the moral side of the whole affair? What affair? The way you're going to retrieve the diamond? Yes, I've thought about it. If it was only simple theft, I would be clapped in chains if I'm caught. To set a thief to catch a thief is an act of great virtue. Maybe, but the laws of the country will not agree to that. I'm not concerned with that. The lawmakers of the country are free to catch me if they can. Next afternoon, Bomkish went out alone and came back late in the evening. Later, I asked him while sipping a cup of tea, How far have you progressed? Distractedly, Bomkish bit into a samosa and said, Not much. The old man is a hard nut to crack. There is a Nepali chokidar who has an eye like a hawk. Anyhow, the old man wants a secretary. So I gave him two applications. Tell me everything. Sipping his tea, Bomkish said, Whatever Kumar Bahadur said was quite true. His uncle is a very shrewd person. The house is like a museum, a collection of beautiful things. He lives alone there, but there is no dearth of loyal and trusted employees. Firstly, it is difficult to enter the compound. There are four chokidars with guns at the gate. They ask a thousand questions if you wish to go in. It is impossible to scale the eight feet high surrounding wall, which is topped with iron spikes. If you somehow manage to go through the gate by flattering the four watchmen, then you have to face Ujre Singh, the Nepali servant who is sitting at the front door like a ferocious tiger. If you can't give him a convincing excuse to go in, your chances of getting inside are nil. The arrangements at night are even better. The human guards are already there. On top of that, there are four watchdogs, which are left loose in the compound. So it is impossible to get my work done in the silence of the night. Now what? There is a way. The old fellow needs a secretary. He has put in an advertisement. The salary is a thousand rupees, and he has to stay in the house. He should be a science graduate and have a knowledge of shorthand and typing and various other good qualities. So, I have put in two applications. Tomorrow is the interview. Why did you put in two applications? One for you and one for me, so that if one of us fails, the other will pass. Next morning, that is on Monday, 
We went for an interview at eight in the morning at Sir Digendra Narayan's house. His house was in a posh area of South Calcutta. When we pushed our way through the barricade of watchmen, we found that there were quite a few job seekers waiting for their turn. We were made to sit in one room and we looked askance at each other. Bonkish and I pretended that we did not know each other. That was our plan. The master of the house was calling each candidate individually from somewhere inside the house. We were worried that someone would be chosen for the job, and we would not be called at all. But luckily, we found that the disappointed candidates were leaving one after the other after the interview. The last ones left to be interviewed were Bomkish and I. Needless to say, we had given false names in our applications. Bomkish was Nikhilesh and I was Jitendranath. I was mentally reciting my new name in case I should forget it, when a servant came and called both of us together. We were a little surprised. Till now, each candidate was being called individually. Why were we being called together? Anyway, we followed the servant without a word to the master of the house. In a huge room, devoid of any furniture except a big secretariat table, Sir Digendra Narayan was sitting on a chair behind the table, facing the door. He was a huge man, wearing a sleeveless firan. Can you imagine a bulldog with grisly beard and moustache? Well, Sir Digendra looked like one. Your first reaction after seeing him would be to turn round and run from the room. His head was like a huge round vessel. There was a bald patch in the centre. He had no chin. His huge hairy arms reminded one of a frightening ape. Surprisingly, his fingers were delicate, slim, long and artistic. His eyes were small and deep-set, aggressively hunting for an adversary to fight. This man, who resembled a giant from the Arabian Nights, looked as if he had the capacity to do both good and evil. He inspired fear as well as respect. We humbly paid our obeisance and stood in front of the table. Those small eyes looked from one to another and fixed on Bonkish. Then there was a curious smile on the huge face. I don't know if a bulldog smiles, but if it did, it would have looked like him. The smile vanished. He ordered in a deep voice, Ujre, shut the door. The servant did exactly as he was told and went out. The master glanced at our applications on the table and said, Who is Nikolish? Bomkis said, I am Nikolish. The master said, You are Nikolish and you are Jitendranath. So you have conspired to apply together? Bonkis said, Sir, I don't know him. Really? You don't know each other? But I came to a different conclusion after reading your applications. Anyway, you have passed your MSc exams? Yes, sir from Calcutta University. He picked up a thick book on the table and said, Which year? Petrified, I realized that the book was the University Gazette, which had the names of all the successful candidates of the past years. I began perspiring with nervousness. Now we will be caught. But Bomkish said in a steady voice, I passed this year, sir. My results came about a month back. I heaved a sigh of relief. The names of this year's candidates were not yet included in the Gazette. The gentleman pushed the book aside and then began cross-questioning Bomkish. He could not find any fault or loopholes in his answers. Bomkish passed the shorthand test easily. The master was pleased and said, Good. You will serve my purpose. Just sit there. Bonkish sat down. Our employer then sat staring at the table with a frown on his forehead. After some time, he suddenly lifted his head, looked at me, and said, Ajit Babu? Yes. 
He burst into laughter like a huge bomb. His body was heaving with uncontrolled laughter. I was puzzled at his sudden burst of amusement and looked at Bomkish. He was looking at me with an accusing expression. I realized that I had blundered and I was full of shame and remorse. I had spoiled everything in a moment with my carelessness. The gentleman's laughter continued about five minutes, the sound reverberating in the room. He wiped his tears of laughter and looking at my shamefaced expression, said, Don't feel so sad. There is no shame in my catching you out. I am surprised and amused that you should even imagine that being so young in maturity and intelligence, you would be able to cheat me. We were silent. He looked at Bomkish and said, I did not expect this stupidity from you. You are young, but the shape of your head indicates that you are intelligent. He stared at Bomkish's head and said, You have at least fifty-five ounces of brain in your skull. But it's not enough just to have brains. Everything depends on convolutions. High cheekbones and a prominent jawbone, hooked nose, the shape of the face, all indicate a fast thinker and walker, shrewd and stubborn, a great deal of intu intuition, well-developed reasoning power, but it has not matured yet. Yes, more or less intelligent. I felt that he was doing a post-mortem of a living person. He was dissecting and weighing Bomkish's brain, and I was standing by and observing it. The gentleman stopped his soliloquy and said, Do you know how much brain I have? Sixty ounces. Five ounces more than you. In other words, the difference in the weight of the brain of an ape and a human being. That is the difference between your brain and mine. In fact, a bit more. Bonkish sat like a statue with a blank expression. Again, Sir Vigindra laughed. Then suddenly he became serious and said, I know that my nephew has sent you to steal something from me. Do you think you will succeed? Even now, Bonkish did not reply. Observing his silence, the gentleman said, What's wrong, Bonkish? Have you forgotten to speak? You have taken up a great task. You tried to disguise yourself to get hold of a great object. So what do you think? Will you succeed? Bonkish said coolly, I have promised Kumar Bahadur that I will give back his stone to him within seven days. Vigindra's huge face looked frightening. He puckered hairy eyebrows knotted on his forehead. Really? You are very bold and cheeky, but how will you succeed? I will throw you out of the house right now. Then how will you come back? Bomkish smiled and said, Your words have made something obvious. The diamond is in the house. His eyes flashing with anger, the master said, Yes, it is in this house, but will you be able to find it? Do you have that much of intelligence? Bomkish only smiled. This seemed to infuriate the gentleman, and he looked as if he was about to burst. The prominent veins on his forehead started throbbing. His eyes gleamed with revenge. If there was any weapon near him, Bomkish would have been at a great risk of life. Thank God that there was nothing near at hand. So he shook his great head and said, Look here, Bomkish Babu. You think that you are very intelligent, isn't it? You think that you are the greatest detective this side of the Atlantic. I will not throw you out. You will have complete freedom to come in and go out of this house. Find out what you have come for. You have given your word that you will find it within seven days. I am giving you seven years. Find it if you can and be damned. He stood up. Ujre Singh? Ujre Singh came out at once. The master showed us to him and said, Look at these two gentlemen. Allow them to come into the house even if I am not there. You can move anywhere inside the house. 
don't stop them. Ujray Singh looked at us and said, Yes, sir, and went out. Then Sir Digendra rolled like a lion. Finders, keepers, have you understood, Bonkish Chandra? Bonkish said, Sir, only Bonkish, not Bonkish Chandra. Never mind. You will grow old and die, but you will never find the diamond. It is impossible for Bonkish Bokshi to find what Digin Roy has hidden. If you need the keys to my vaults, you just have to ask. I have priceless things in them, but I don't distrust you. But I am warning you about one thing. Do not destroy my paintings and statues in your eagerness to search for the diamond. If you break or tear or destroy any of the works of art, you will be asked to leave immediately, and you will lose your chances of ever getting the diamond. Pleasing us with such polite and genial conversation, he stomped out of the room. We sat facing each other quietly. Bonkish was also tired after his tete a tete with the old man. His smile was pale when he said, Let's go back home. Nothing can be done today. It was insulting and demoralizing for us to be caught while trying to fool someone. So we went back home unhappy and defeated. After taking a cup of tea, I recovered a bit and said, Bonkish, it is because of my foolishness that you have been insulted like this. Bonkish said, Yes, you were foolish, but that did not alter anything. The old man knew everything right from the beginning. Do you remember that gentleman in the train? The one who said that he would get down at the next stop and got on to the next compartment? He was this gentleman's spy. The old man knows every detail about us. You really made a fool of us. This has never happened before. Bonkish said, after a few minutes of silence, Thank God that the old man has a terrible weakness. Otherwise, we would have to give it all up. I sat up. How? Do you still have some hope? Of course. Had he thrown us out, then it would have been difficult. Anyway, since the old man has shown a weakness, we will have to use it to our advantage to win the day. What weakness are you talking about? I saw no chink in his armor. It seemed thick and strong as iron. But there is a hole, and a big one at that, and through that hole we have managed to enter the house. I don't know why. But these great people are always susceptible to this weakness. The more intelligent they are, the greater is their pride. So sometimes their intelligence goes to waste. Why are you talking in riddles? Please tell me clearly without insinuations. The old man's greatest weakness is his pride in his intelligence. I realized it right at the beginning, so I used this to get my work done. Half the battle is won because I have managed to enter the house. Now the only thing left is to find the diamond. Are we going there again? Of course. I can't let this chance slip from my hands. If you go this time, Ujray Singh will stab you with his dagger. Anyway, do whatever you want. I am not in it. Bomke smiled and said, That's not possible. You have to accompany me. We are in it together. The next day we went early to Sir Digendra's house. I felt as nervous as a ticketless traveller when we entered the house. But the watchman said nothing to us. Ujra Singh pretended not to see us. Bomkish talked to a servant and got to know that the master of the house was in his studio. Then began our search. Only Bonkish could dare to look for a small stone in this huge mansion. Anyone else would have been disheartened and would have left the job. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Firstly, it was useless to search those places like almiras, cupboards and vaults where precious things are usually kept. The old man was too shrewd to keep the diamond in these obvious places. 
then where would it be? I had read a story by Edgar Allan Poe where an important document had been hidden in a very innocuous place. Bonkish was not a person to idle away his time. He began a regular search. He tested the walls to see if these were hollow. He took out nearly every book from a huge cupboard. Sir Digendra's house was a virtual art gallery with beautiful paintings and sculptures. Every room had beautiful pictures and statues made of plaster of Paris. But the house had very little furniture. It did not take more than two hours to search the whole house. Our search, of course, was fruitless. Lastly, we went to the studio where Sir Digendra was working. We knocked at the door and a deep voice asked us to come in. The room was large, a table covered with one entire side of the room. There were many scientific instruments on the table. As soon as we entered, Sir Digendra roared with laughter. Hello, Bumkish Babu. Did you get your touchstone? You will grow a beard like old Rib Van Winkle by the time you get your stone. Bumkish said, I want to see your steel vault. Sir Digendra said, Sure, here, take the keys. I would have helped you to look for the diamond, but at present I'm busy with this plaster cast. Ajit Babu will help you instead, or maybe Ujre Singh. Bomkish stopped his sarcastic comments by asking, What's that you are doing? He smiled slightly and said, You must have heard about my world-famous statues of Nataraj. This is a miniature of the same. There is another one on my table, which you must have seen. It's not bad as a paperweight. I remember that I had seen an exquisite statue of Nataraj on his table. I realized that that must be the miniature of his famous Nataraj statue. I said admiringly, Is that the one you exhibited in Paris? He said casually, Yes, the original statue is in stone, and at present it is in Louvre. We came out of the room. This man's versatility impressed me greatly. So when Bomkish started looking for the through the vault, I just stood aside. Was it possible to fight war with this genius? After his search, Bomkish sighed and said, No, nothing here. Let's go and sit in the drawing room for some time. When we entered the room, we found Digendra already there, smoking a cigar proportionate to his size. He looked at Bomkish and said, Didn't get it? Never mind. Rest a while, then begin your search again. Bonkish gave back the keys, which Digendra casually put in his pocket, and asked me, Ajit Babu, you're a writer, so you must be appreciating true art and beauty. What do you think of this small statue? Saying this, he handed the miniature of Nataraj to me. The statuette was about six inches in height and three inches in circumference, but even within these limits it was exquisite. Every expression of the Nataraja's dance of destruction was etched on each part of the body of that little statue. I looked at it admiringly and said, Beautiful. It has no comparison. Bomkish asked disinterestedly, Did you mold it yourself? Sir Digendra blew out a mouthful of smoke and said, Who will do it except me? Bromkish took the statue from me and looked at it. It is available in the market? Sir Digendra said, No. Why? Would you have bought it if it was? Maybe. Why don't you make plaster casts of this statue on a larger scale and sell it in the market? I think there is money in such a business. Annoyed, Digendra said, If I need money badly, I will take your advice. At present, I don't want to cheapen my work of art by selling it in the market. Bomkesh got up and said, We will go now and come again in the afternoon. Saying this, he kept the statue on the table with a loud thud. Sir Digendra was at once startled and annoyed. Are you a fool? 
You would have broken it just now. Then he looked at Bromkish like an angry tiger and said, I have already warned you that if you destroy any of my paintings or statues, you will be thrown out of my house. Bromkish looked repentant and said he was sorry for his carelessness. Sir Digindra cooled down. I can't tolerate negligent of my art pieces. Anyway, come in the afternoon. Which side of the house will you search this time? If you want to dig up the garden, I will also make arrangements for that. It is good to see you so determined. We digested his scorn and came out of the house. Bromkish said, Let's go to the National Library. In the library, Bromkish read the portions on plaster castings in great detail. I noticed that for some reason he was quite excited. After returning home, I asked, Why are you so curious about plaster casting? Bromkish said, You know that I am sometimes unnecessarily curious. That is my weakness. I know that. But what did you find out? I found out that plaster casting is a very simple thing. Anyone can do it. You have to mix some plaster of Paris in water and stir it till it becomes thick. Then you have to pour it slowly into a mold. Within ten minutes it hardens. And then it is to be taken out from the mold. The only thing which is difficult is to make the mold. Why are you so worried about all this? No, I'm not worried. If a person put, a, put in a small rounded stone while pouring the plaster of Paris, then it will remain in the statue. What do you mean? Bromkish looked at me quizzically and said, Whoever understands will realize. In the afternoon, we again went to Sir Digindra's house. Again we searched the house minutely without any result. Sir Digindra sometimes came to make scornful digs at us. At last, tired, we came to the sitting room and rested a bit. We were served tea and snacks. I was ashamed to take the tea, but I found that Bromkish quite shamelessly consumed everything that was served, while talking to Digindra amiably. Sir Digindra asked, For how long are you going to try? Are you not going to give up? Bromkesh said, Today is Wednesday. I have two more days. Sir Digindra laughed loudly. Bromkesh did not react, but picked up the Natrat statue from the table and said, When did you make this one? Sir Digindra thought for some time and said, about fifteen or twenty days back. Why? No particular reason. We will come tomorrow. Goodbye. Bromkesh stood up. As soon as we returned, Putiram, our servant, gave us a letter, which he said had been delivered by an uniformed peon. The envelope contained only a visiting card of Kumar Tridiv Narayan Roy. On the opposite side was a small note in pencil. I have arrived just now, putting up at the Grand Hotel. How far have you progressed? Bromkish kept the card aside and sat on the armchair. I realized that he was not happy at the sudden arrival of Kumar Bahadur. When I asked him, he said, his anxiety may affect the other party. His arrival may make the old man nervous and he may change his plans. Then I will have to begin all over again. Bromkish relaxed in the armchair the whole evening. We slept in the same room in two separate beds. Usually we chatted for a long time before going off to sleep. But this night, Bromkish was silent. I spoke in soliloquy for some time and then went off to sleep. I dreamt that Bromkish, Sir Digindra and I were playing marbles with diamonds. Bromkish was winning all the diamonds and Sir Digindra was howling like a little boy. I woke up with a start. I found Bromkish sitting by my bed in the dark. When he realized that I was awake, he said, I'm sure that the diamond is on the table in the sitting room. I asked sleepily, What time of the night is it? 
2.30 a.m. Did you notice that the old man always glances at the table whenever he enters the room? I said, maybe. Now you close your eyes and go to sleep. Bomkish began speaking to himself. Why does he look at the table? Is it in the drawer? No, it is on the table. What are the things on the table? An ivory ink pot, a small timepiece, a bottle of gum, a few books, blotting pad, a box of cigars, pin cushions, not Raj. I went off to sleep. Whenever I woke up at night, I found Bonkish walking up and down the room. In the morning, Bonkish wrote a letter to Kumar Tridib and posted it. He was asked not to worry and to wait till Sunday when Bonkish would meet him. We went out again. I realized that Bomkesh had come to a conclusion after staying up the whole night. So the Gindru was in the sitting room. He welcomed us heartily as soon as he saw us. Welcome, my inseparable friends. You are very early today. Bring tea for the two gentlemen. Bomkesh Babu, your face is small and you look tired. Could you not sleep due to anxiety? Bomkesh picked up the Nataraj from the table and said, I am in love with this statue. I could not sleep last night because of this. For a minute, their eyes locked. There seemed to be a silent war between the two. After some time, Sardegindra laughed and said, I have understood what you mean, Bomkesh. You can't cheat this old man. You said you couldn't sleep because of this statue. All right, I am presenting it to you. Bomkish was truly startled. Seeing his expression, the old man said, Now what? You did not expect this, did you? But don't destroy the statue. It is of great value to me. Bomkish recovered in a minute, wrapped the statue in a hanky, put it in his pocket and said, Thank you. Then again we continued our fruitless search and returned home. Sitting on the chair, Bomkis said, I was wrong. I said, what happened? I could understand nothing that passed between the two of you. Talking out the statue, Bomkis said, I was certain after much thought that the diamond was inside this statue. Just think. This was a perfect place to hide the stone. It is in front of everyone's eyes, yet no one would suspect anything. The Gindranath could easily put the diamond inside while casting it in plaster of Paris. Moreover, the Gindranath loves the diamond so much that he would always want it near him without raising anyone's suspicion. So I was positive that the diamond was in the statue, and I was going to challenge the old man into admitting it. But I was wrong. Not only did the old man realize what I was thinking of, but my whole theory had gone for a toss. To pile insult to injury, the old fellow gave me the statue as a present. Now I will have to begin my investigation all over again. I said, There is no time now. There is only one day left. Bomkish turned the statue and wrote his initials below it in pencil and said, Yes, only one day left. I don't think I'll be able to keep my promise. Kumar is already in Calcutta. This old man is really making me a laughing stock. Saying this, Bomkish kept the statue on the table and sat with his head bent. In the afternoon, as usual, Bomkish and I went to the house of Sir Digendra. We learned that the master had gone out. Bomkesh tried a new device. He asked me to go away so that he could have a friendly chat with Ujre Singh. I wandered about the garden and noticed Ujre Singh and Bomkesh talking. It was true that Bomkesh could easily gain the confidence of people, but I doubted if he would be able to thaw the Himalayan eyes of the Nepali Ujre Singh. After two hours, when the two of us came out of that house, Bonkesh said, My efforts were useless. 
Either Rajri Singh is very stupid or much more intelligent than I am. After returning home, we were informed by our servant that someone had waited for us for half an hour and had left saying that he would come back. Bumkish said tiredly, There must have been Kumar's man. I was tired of the whole business and told Bumkish, Leave this case. This time you will have to admit defeat. Tell Kumar Sahib that you are sorry. Why keep him hoping? Sitting at the table, Bomkish was playing with the Nataraj and said, Let's see, we still have tomorrow. Before he could complete his sentence, I found that the expression on his face had changed to one of intense excitement. He was staring at the Nataraj. What happened? I asked. With trembling hands, Bomkish passed the statue to me and said, Look! You must remember that I had written my initials at the bottom. This statue does not have it. I saw that it was not there. But what was there g to get so excited about? The initials were written in pencil. It could have been rubbed off. Bumkish said, Can't you understand? He laughed loudly. What a fool the old man has made of us. But a giant has a giant killer too. Putiram, he called. When our servant, Putiram, came, Bomkish asked, Where did the gentleman who waited for us sit? In this room, sir. Were you here with him all the time? Yes, but in between he asked for a glass of water, so... Okay, you may go. Bomkish smiled quietly to himself. You will be surprised to know that the diamond was here on my table from morning till this evening. I was surprised. Has Bomkesh gone out of his mind? I heard him talking to Srivendra Narayan over the phone. You will get your diamond by ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Your special train should be ready. As soon as you get the thing, you should start. It is not safe for you to stay here with the thing. Please see that you leave Calcutta by ten. All right, I will arrange for the special train. Don't say anything to anyone, not even to your secretary. Then he went out, probably to arrange for a special train. He told me to take my dinner and go to bed because he would be late. I don't know when Bomkesh returned. Next morning, at 8.30, we went out as usual. I noticed that the Natraj statue was not in its place on our table. When I asked Bomkesh, he only said, I have kept it. Sir Vigendra was in his sitting room. He saw us and said, You have become a habit with me. I have learned to wait for you to come. Bomkesh said apologetically, We have given you a lot of trouble. We won't any more. That is, what we have come to tell you. In a game like this, one has to lose and the other will win. It is no use feeling sorry for it. It's better to accept it. You won't see us from tomorrow. You already know that your nephew is here. Yesterday I told him to leave Calcutta. I will give him my final answer today. Sir Vigendra stared at Bonkish. Then he smiled again like a bulldog and said, I'm glad that you have come to your senses. Tell my nephew not to waste his time. All right. Bomkish picked up another Nataraj statue from the table and said, You have made a new one. I have kept your gift with great care, not only because it's beautiful, but because it will be, it will be a souvenir of your memory. If it breaks, will I get another one? Sir Vigindra was pleased. Yes, you will get another one. You have learned to appreciate art in my house. That is a great thing. With great humility, Bomkesh said, Really, all these past years, that area of my mind had been covered with a dark curtain. It was in your presence that I began to appreciate art. 
I have realized what invaluable, priceless matter is hidden in art. I like that painting behind you. Have you done that too? It was a beautiful painting. So Ligand returned his head to look at it. In a second, Bomkes showed tremendous light of hand by exchanging the Nataraj on the table with the one in his pocket. When Sir Digin returned his face, Bonkish was looking admiringly at the painting. Sir Digindra said, Yes, I have done it. My heart began thumping with excitement. I heard his voice from a distance. I was lucky that he did not look at my expression. He would surely have caught us out then. Bonkish got up slowly and said, We will leave now. I have benefited after coming in contact with you. I will never forget that. I hope you too won't forget me. I'm a truth seeker. My hobby and my passion is to find out the truth. If you ever need me, I will be only too eager to help you. Come, Ajit. Goodbye, sir. I turned around to see that Sir Digendra was looking at Bomkish quizzically, half aware of Bomkish's Bum innuendos. We caught a taxi and began driving to Grand Hotel. I caught Bomkish by the hand and said, What's happening? Bomkish smiled. Didn't you understand? My assumption that the diamond was in the Natraj was correct. The old man understood and to puzzle me presented me with that very statue. Then he made another one exactly like the first and exchanged it with the one he had given me in my own house. I would not have understood anything if I had not scribbled my initials at the bottom of the statue. He turned the statue and showed me the faded initials. When I found that my initials were not there under the statue last evening, I realized that it had been exchanged. Everything became clear. Later you saw the trick I played to exchange the statue in the presence of Sir Digindra. Are you sure that the diamond is in the statue? What if it isn't? If it isn't, then I will think that there is nothing called logic or conjecture or truth in this world. In the hotel, Kumar Bahadur said, This is Uncle Snatraj. Where's my diamond? It is inside the statue. I can't understand anything. Are you sure? said a visibly impatient Kumar. Bonkish struck the statue with vaporweight. It broke into pieces. Bonkish picked up the diamond from the crumbled pieces of plaster of Paris and handed it to the gentleman. Take your diamond. Although some broken pieces of plaster were still sticking to it, it could easily be recognized as a priceless object, even by amateurs. Kumar Bahadur virtually snatched the diamond from Bomkish's hand, stared at it, and said delightedly, Yes, this is my diamond. I don't know how to thank you. Look at it. It is giving off a light blue ray. Bomkish said, Now you leave Calcutta as fast as you can. If your uncle discovers that the diamond is with you, he will make another plan. No, no. I will leave just now. But your fees? Pay me later. First you must reach home safely. We took Kumar to the station, came back home and relaxed in our room. Bomkish said smilingly, I just want to show what the old man will do when he discovers the loss. After a few days, we received the registered envelope from Kumar Bahadur. A check was attached to a letter from him. Dear Bonkish Babu, I'm sending you this small sum as a token of my eternal gratitude. Please accept it, although I know that it is a pittance in comparison to your talent. I'm looking forward to meeting you in the near future. The next time I go to Calcutta, I will get to know from you all that had happened. Please thank Ajit Babu for me. He's a writer. I don't want to insult his art by offering him money. If he wishes to write, write the story of this diamond by changing names and places, 
then I will not object. My respects, yours admiringly, said Trivendra Narayan Roy.